Hi, I'm John Everest, and you're listening to the Sound Architect Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Architect Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Hughes, and as you just heard, I'm joined today by composer John Everest. Thanks for joining me today, John. How are you? I'm very good, very good. It's it's nice to finally chat with you. Yeah, likewise. And uh, we're polar opposites on the world right now. I'm having my coffee, and uh, it's evening time, your time. <laughs> That's right. I'm just getting ready for bed, uh, and you're waking up and ready to tackle the day. Exactly. So, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you've had a hard day already. <laughs> yeah, it's been, I, I mean... It's it's been a crazy few months, I think, for everybody. Yeah, but yeah, I've been I've been lucky to be extremely busy, um, which uh, is definitely a, a blessing. Um, but uh, it, it's just weird, man. It's like you know, I think as a composer, you, at least for me, there's this act of rebellion going on where you have chosen a kind of non-conventional job and you're choosing to lock yourself up into uh, your studio all day and write music uh, until the late hours of the night. Uh, but but with this pandemic thing, it's like that act of rebellion is kind of taken away from you. And it's like, no, you don't have a choice. You have to stay inside. Yeah. It's been a little unnerving, but uh, luckily, yeah, I've been, been, been busy. So uh, that's good. Yeah, I think it's a common mentality. I think I have the same, really. I mean, obviously it makes sense to stay in and be safe and everything like that. Um, but as soon as choices are taken away from me, I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I want to do that now. I may not have done it for six years, but now that you've told me I can't, maybe I want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whenever my friends call to ask me to come out, like it's my choice that I say no, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so before we talk about one of your recent projects that I really want to talk about, Disintegration, um, I just wanted to ask, how did your journey into music composition begin? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's probably the same for, for lots of composers. I think that the path for uh, for writing music and specifically for writing music for video games and film, it's never really a straight line. I think a lot of people trying to get into the industry think that, you know, they maybe missed their chance to, to make a transition into writing music for for film or just making music in general. But for me, I'm kind of like an example of of the opposite. So I, I was making music at a at a, a young age. I was uh, I was a percussionist, playing played drums in band and stuff, and 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 did that whole route in school. Nice in like middle school, elementary school, and stuff like that. But also, like I was a kid in like the '90s and late '80s, and so I was like really got into electronic music and sort of like the the um the burgeoning like hip-hop scene uh production hip-hop scene and stuff uh during the 90s and kind of went that that route of 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 producing music and doing like electronic stuff and a lot of sampling and whatnot been playing games since i was uh very young also i think like final fantasy uh, I think five Final Fantasy five is what it was wow, called. Wow, awesome! Final Fantasy three, but yeah, that was that was to me that was the game or piece of art that got me into music in general. I think that started my appreciation of music uh, nice. beyond like radio music and stuff. Uh, but I never connected the dots. I never thought like, oh, well, that's something I can do. Um, that's something that I can like go to school for, or I can study for, or whatever. It just I never thought a million years that was possible so i was more you know doing percussion and 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 pursuing music in other ways uh but didn't really connect those dots until i was like in my mid-20s i would say so i i was kind of like gigging and and producing music and then i think like i always latch on to this game for for whatever reason but it really stuck out to me there was a game uh, Splinter Cell Chaos Theory that was that was oh, yeah. music was done by Almond Tobin who I had I was a fan of and and I hadn't really like made the connection of um, these musicians that were doing kind of crossover into video games and stuff and so I heard that score and I was I was just kind of blown away I was like oh wow like video game music is something that 
not saying that I'm on the level of uh, Amatometer or anything at that time, but I was I was listening to that soundtrack and I was thinking like, wow, I I really think this is something that I could ha- have a hand at and try try to do. And I kind of did a total pivot in my life at that time um, and decided to go back to school to study music. Um, I went to uh, DigiPen uh, Institute of Technology, which is primarily a game design school, but um, they also do uh, music and sound design for video games. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so that kind of uh, uh, inserted me into the... um, kind of the world of video games that I I thought was inaccessible for, for such a long time, uh, writing music for video games. And yeah, I mean, from there at just kind of snowballed a bit, I I was lucky enough to score a lot of student games that, that, uh, did pretty well there. And then, um, these students would go on to studios in the area and got a break for writing a trailer piece for Hairbrain Schemes, which did the Shadowrun games in Battletech. And they liked the trailer. They kept asking me back. And it was kind of, yeah, just I got very lucky, I think. That's awesome, though. And it's crazy, right? I'm going to sound like such an old man now because um, back in my day, they didn't have all these um, games courses or like writing for games courses. Or, or there weren't many of them, really. Um, and now there's like millions of them. There's millions of like do sound for games, do music for games. Um, and I don't know if that's harder or easier because at least before you kind of like stood out a little bit because you found your own path and you carved your way in and you were like, look, I want to do this. Like I'm, I'm doing this. Um, whereas now there's like thousands of like 22 year olds coming out of uni going, I've been trained in music composition for games. Let's go compete. (laughs) Um, So I don't know like how the climate's changed for the, for the better or for the worse, really in terms of difficulty of getting into the industry. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think there's a reason why most studios don't post uh, composing jobs on their websites anymore is because there, there's a deluge of, of people kind of wanting to break into the industry uh, and a lot of people that are highly qualified also. I think that also is is correlated with just accessibility to technology now. I mean, computing yeah, power is so much different and, and you get a, a MacBook Pro and your, your, your capabilities with that thing is uh, ridiculous compared to somebody in the late eighties or nineties trying to do. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I think regardless, there's so much luck involved in this sort of industry. Um, I think it's the same in, in film to a certain extent. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like increasing your odds, being in the right place at the right time and getting that one person that listens to your demo and has you do something for them is really for me what it took and i think it is probably still the case to a certain extent you know i i can't imagine what it's like for for studios that are looking for composers now i think for indie games yeah it's 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 maybe a little easier to um to sift through the the applicants um but uh yeah it's it's uh it's a jungle out there in terms of lots of people uh, uh, kind of trying to get these gigs as they come up. Yeah, definitely. And I have a, another question on that, actually, which has probably been asked about a million times. Um, but there's always this conversation about whether you should diversify yourself or whether you should focus on a particular area and get really good at that. Um, now, as a composer, I'm not really sure what that means because you know, genre wise, you can never really just focus on one genre and go, I'm great at this one genre. Um, and still, I mean, I guess you can, right? But it kind of limits you in terms of what work you can go for. Yeah, I mean, like when I was first starting out, I just by the nature of like, I have no money, <laughs> I'm trying to get any work, <laughs> work that I can. I'm like, I'm a sound designer too, right? Yeah. I think I think my dream at that point was like okay I've already you know mortgaged my 
entire life to pay for school to go back and take this huge chance at at uh at trying to make it in in music professionally as a composer but if i land anywhere in audio i'll be okay right i'll, I'll yeah. be okay spirit spiritually yes mentally <laughs> um right so yeah i think at the beginning like i was like i'm a jack of all all trades you know whatever you want i can do and and of course you know there's there's a fair amount of like salesmanship going on there of course yeah but then yeah after a while when you get start to get continuously like a little bit lucky and 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 are able to focus on on narrowing your skill set or focusing your your craft a little bit yeah you you definitely want to focus on doing something well or or at least expressing yourself in a way that um is your calling card you know to a certain extent or somebody can listen to a piece of music maybe whatever genre it's in they could they could listen to it and and say well this sounds like you know something this person wrote because of such and such or whatever it is yeah. so to a certain extent i think there's there there are like you know specificity in in writing styles and calling cards for composers but yeah you do have to be also like a jack of all trades to a certain extent i mean right now for me is is a good example i'm writing i'm on a few projects right now one is uh like a, a cyberpunk uh james bond big brass mixed with uh, nice. uh yeah mixed with uh synths and that sounds epic <laughs> it's fun it's fun i'm excited to, to chat about that hopefully I, i'll be able to um talk more about that in the next few months um and then another one is like uh, pretty straight ahead, you know, Indiana Jones, John John Williams esque, but you know, not as good as John John Williams. John Williams uh, uh, adjacent uh, at best. Um, and then <laughs> and then another project is um, like you know, lots of modular synth, really dark horror sort of uh, Sicario meets. Um, I don't know, demon hunter or something. Um, so yeah, like you have to be able to, to jump between styles a lot. Yeah. But I think there's, there's at least for me, you're always, you're always trying to avoid mimicry and more um, express yourself while still bring being yourself, express yourself in a different um, a genre while still being yourself as a composer that's difficult though it's a tough line to walk isn't it because you you kind of want to like you say you want to be good at many things but not too many things right but also not limit yourself to like one or two things so it's a it's a tricky tricky balance to find for sure yeah it's kind of a constant battle of uh you know you don't usually turn down offers to do projects also but there's also projects that you really take and you're like okay i need to woodshed this and really expand my my compositional vocabulary to do this the right way um and i think that's just part of being a composer it's it's really you have to look at it as a craftsperson and and see each new project as a challenge and kind of an expansion of um of your vocabulary as a composer yeah definitely so let's talk about disintegration so it's the first project from v1 right which was set up by the co-creator of halo i mean that's pretty exciting yeah the first first um first project from v1 interactive uh, marcus leto is the uh founder of v1 and he's the co-creator of halo and um funny enough i the first meeting that I had with uh, Marcus, I actually missed the meeting completely. Um, I had some scheduling snafu happen and had the wrong day entered in my calendar. So got a text message that was like, hey, where are you? We're here. <laughs> oh, no, they're the worst. That's like anxiety instantly, isn't it? It's like, oh, no. <laughs> the co-creator of Halo wants you to score their game uh, and you missed your late. first meeting. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that whole thing was, um, it was just, it was pretty surreal for me. Like uh, the process of, of getting that gig is just kind of another example of the, 
you know, the luck and chance factor happening. I had yeah. a friend of mine who I knew from DigiPen, uh, uh, who's actually on the faculty there, ended up um, getting a job at at the that studio. Didn't know anything about the studio at all. No idea Marcus was involved and sent her a message and just sent her a congratulations message and with kind of like a little tongue in cheek, like, oh, let me know if you need music, you know, as all composers tend to do. Yeah. Do you need a... <laughs> and um, oddly enough, uh, she was like, I actually, yeah, uh, we do need music. And I ended up sending a demo. Yeah, see, it feels a bit cheesy sometimes, but it works, right? I know. <laughs> and it was it's one of those times where like, I was like, okay, I'm deleting Facebook. I hate this <laughs> website. I'm 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 off it. It's worthless. You know, all these all yeah. I all I see is uh, um, forums where people are just you know complaining and and uh, uh, getting upset about this and that. And of course, that very day was when I got that message. So and that's it. Now you're on Facebook forever. I'm Facebook for life. <laughs> <laughs> So let me see if I've got the setting right, okay? So it's like a century into the future. There's been like a plague that wiped out um, humanity-ish. And basically, humans have gone into like hiding. So what they've done is they've created this method called integration, where they put their minds into like mech suits, like robotic suits, to go out and explore and find ways of making a cure. Is that right? Yeah. uh, Yeah, so essentially, the only way to save humanity from this um this disease that's been spreading uh which is i mean during this pandemic uh it was hard to avoid these bizarre similarities i was gonna say yeah <laughs> I, I mean this this game has been uh marcus has been developing this idea for i think like the past like six or seven years so it was oh, one of yeah, those of moments course. it's not a recent thing <laughs> yeah where where you're like oh my gosh like this is this is kind of uh heavy at the moment um <laughs> but yeah so it's it's the only way to to save humanity is essentially to um remove the brain from the host and put the brain into what they call like uh, an armature, a robotic uh, humanoid sort of thing. Yeah. And, and that protects the brain from the disease. And the plan was also always to, this is temporary, like we'll, we'll put the brain back into the original body uh, once there's a cure. Yeah. And then the rub is that the actual, um, uh, the process of integration was, kind of uh i guess this nefarious plot by this uh, evil force called the rayon uh which is essentially a group of um integrated uh humans that have sort of opted to completely integrate with robotics in a yeah, way never return to being human exactly basically. so um, some of the the robotic rayon are are um, are not human at all. They're they're almost completely robotic. And then the leadership of the the group is augmented to the point of of almost complete completely being robotic, but they still have a little bit of their humanity left. And the style of game is like it's a kind of crazy first person shooter. Is it multiplayer? It was right. There is multiplayer. There's a single player campaign also. But the um, yeah, the style is it's basically a first person shooter, but it's also kind of got this RTS element where, you know, you're not stuck on the ground. You're kind of up in the air in this thing called the grav cycle, which is basically like a, a, a flying motorcycle. And you're able to do these commands for your crew on the ground, which is the RTS element of it. And it's basically... Your, your um, squad on the ground is three to four people, uh, three to four uh, integrated people. And um, they have like special powers and stuff. You can, um, you know, throw a grenade that slows time or shoot oh, uh, awesome. rocket launchers. Yeah. So it's kind of like a mix, a, a hybrid of first person and, and, um, and RTS. Uh, it was a really cool concept. And when I, when I was first brought in, uh, Marcus had, a pretty like fleshed out demo of, of the thing. And it was, you know, the only thing I could think of at the time that I had played that was like, that was 
a game called Descent, and that was quite some time ago. But um, I'm sure there's a few other games that kind of do that element a little bit. But it was really a unique, um, a unique style of game that I hadn't seen. Yeah, and it looks really interesting. And that kind of game, what what brief were you given to work with when you were first involved on the project? Yeah, the, you know, when I first came in, the brief was you know, the, the focus primarily was single single player campaign. I don't even think we had talked about multiplayer at that point. I think after a while it became clear that multiplayer was a good kind of avenue to pursue for this sort of game. Um, but it was, you know, I was brought in as, as the primary focus was to focus on this, you know, 15 hour um, story driven campaign um, that was essentially about this ragtag uh, group of integrated folks that are um, coming together to form a resistance to fight against the forces, the rayon forces that are taking over um, and forcing people to, to um, uh, become part of these robotic armatures. And it was just kind of like a, that classic, um, you know, good, ver good versus evil. And, and your main character, Romer kind of has a questionable past in that he, at at, at a certain point, um, kind of aided and abetted the enemy and was fighting for the wrong side to a certain extent. He was sort of pushing people to, to become integrated and uh, essentially become a part of this army uh, unwittingly. And he ends up, the opening scene, he breaks out of this like floating prison um, and that starts the whole story in progress. And so that was, that was kind of pitched to me initially. It was this, this main character, um, uh, breaking out of, um, of prison and kind of fighting against his own captors and forming a resistance to help take down this existential threat to humanity. That's cool. Yeah. And so where did you start? Like when you got given this pitch and you're like, okay, I think I got this you sat down and where do you even begin? Yeah. Um, for, for me, I think uh, like many composers do, I like to start a project with a suite of music. It's kind of an opportunity to write a demo for the project, um, and cover a lot of bases. So I, I kind of, I get into these meetings uh, and absorb as much information as I can. Usually, you know, Marcus is giving me a ton of information about the world. He's telling me about the story, the backstory. I'm absorbing all this concept art that I can. And then uh, I kind of express my ideas uh, to him in terms of what I'm thinking for the score. And um, I get course corrected here and there. But ultimately, I'm just going and looking at the um, art that I have available and the story that I have available and sort of writing a suite of music, a main theme, uh, uh, you know, a love theme if that's involved and a uh, bad guy theme, a combat theme and sort of mashing that all together in one, one piece of music. And the, what I started with for Disintegration was uh, ended up becoming the main theme. So it was, it was the first song that I, I wrote for, uh, for Marcus and, um, started with a solo piano line in one hand that, uh, I, Marcus had told me he really loved piano, really loved, um, hearing music and melody presented in piano. So I was like, Hey, I'll just start, start with a melody, uh, in one hand in the piano straight away and, and nice uh we'll see what happens there <laughs> but, um he you know he really dug it and so it was it was kind of it it sets the tone for the rest of the soundtrack um i i think it's kind of a mood piece it's also the hope is that the suite becomes the main theme um uh or you know part of it becomes the bad guy theme and yeah uh, yeah so that's, that's usually where i start and then uh you know g games are constantly evolving and shifting, changing uh, directional shifts and whatnot. And so as a composer, you are brought on relatively early, hopefully. And so you too are, are having to, to shift and change and adapt um, and, um, you know, keep the score 
uh, up to speed with what's happening in the game. And so that's always uh, always going on. Yeah, definitely. And I was kind of um, pleasantly surprised in a way to hear the piano when I was listening to the main theme. It wasn't quite what I expected for some reason. Like you see the artwork and you see a game like Disintegration um, and you kind of expect this kind of digital or like electronic kind of sound almost instantly, right? Um, and it was really nice to hear these like beautiful melodies and this good combination in the soundtrack. It was great. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, that was one thing that, that struck me right away from hearing the pitch for this was, um, you know, this is kind of like a, a, a commentary on, on post-humanism and what, when do we become not human when we, when we uh, uh, are continuously integrating ourselves with technology and, what makes us human and whatnot. And to me that as a composer, I'm just thinking like, okay, like the easy thing, or maybe not the easy thing, but the, the, what made sense to me was approaching the humanity part of the score with, you know, more of the traditional orchestral ideas. And then as you get more into the integrated post-human um, stuff, making it a little more bizarre, a little more processed, a little more, distorted uh corrupted and processed and so it could be yeah. that we're actually recording live players playing melodies and playing beautiful music but i'm actually taking those and feeding them through the modular synth and and distorting them and using feedback and reversing and all, all this all these things to sort of corrupt the signal as it goes and to me that was like you know that was my touchstone for the um for the score yeah and like um the rayon territory and things like that i'm assuming is where you started to bring in a lot more of that kind of corruption yeah um yeah rayon territory things like uh, uh the costa nueva track um black shuck obviously is the he's kind of the big baddie of yeah he's the main bad guy right yeah so that one in particular like we did a whole bunch of recordings with um, extended techniques and aleatorics and stuff with strings in particular and i was able to take those and process them uh here in, in sort of an uh a jarring way and you know he's almost like a a lot of his cue is 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 horror uh, based okay yeah and and it's he's just like a, a totally corrupted like sick individual even though he's pretty much um completely integrated the, the the small part of his humanity that's left is completely destroyed um and so i you know i just thought i would take you know take some live playing and and mash it up as much as i could and mix it with a lot of synthesis and stuff and so yeah it was it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun to sort of you know take relatively beautiful noises and destroy them <laughs> it's, well, it's definitely fun i won't lie <laughs> so i kind of want to talk uh, a bit of logistics just to just out of curiosity really so how long were you on the project um i think i started in two, was it 2018 what is time anymore i know who even knows how long anything is anymore i think i i think i started um i think i started 2018 okay so around two years yeah it was around two years um yeah i believe it was 2018 and you know, with video games, there's a, there's a lot of, there's kind of a slow ramp up. Usually you're delivering tracks here and there. The game's kind of in a rough state and it's not really typically easy to integrate um, or implement uh, music into the game until much later. But yeah, yeah, I think it was, I think it was around two, two years, which is good. Okay. That's awesome. And like, did you work on it full time for two years or did you have to split it between other work? I assume you're freelance basically, right? Yeah, I'm I'm a freelance, so um, I was it was primarily my my main project, but yeah, I was still freelance, still a contractor, so you know, doing work here and there. I think in that time we had like a, a there was a BattleTech expansion that I did, and then I I did a few films and stuff, and a few smaller games. But yeah, this was this was the biggest project uh, in those two years for sure. Yeah, and how do you? 
how do you divide your time when you have multiple projects, right? Because it must be tricky because you can't really base it on budget to prioritize because <laughs> everyone has a different budget to work with. You can't just go like, oh, well, you're paying me more, so I'll work more on your thing. Um, <laughs> so how do you decide, like, do you think, right, okay, I've got three projects, therefore I split my work week into three equal parts? Um, or do you just kind of play it by ear every week and go, oh, there's more of a timeline, um, like, you know, there's more of a time sensitive deadline for this one. So I should work on that one more this week or like, it's tricky, right? It's really difficult. Can you tell me, do you have the answer to this? Cause I'm struggling with this. <laughs> now. <laughs> no, I mean like it's, I think it's the constant struggle of a freelancer. I think in any field really is every client sort of believes that you're, that they're your baby, right? That they're the yeah, most important uh, uh, project for you. And they are, but also, you know, there's, there's depending on schedules, there's other things going on. It's, it's really difficult. It's not something that is, I mean, I think it's something that most freelance composers spend uh, uh, the most of their stress time stressing about Yeah, how to manage multiple projects at once. I think for me, what works best is, um, I'm really like, uh, and this is not because of like my nature or something. It's because I, I have no choice. I'm really particular about um, working at a certain time and stopping at a certain time. Awesome. That's really good. I think it's, um, I think it can, it, it would easily get out of control and, and throw my whole world into chaos and oh yeah, definitely. my wife's world into <laughs> chaos. Yeah. So I have to, if I have these, I think it's it's similar to um, having constraints in music. So when you set a constraint uh, for yourself musically, you tend to operate more creatively within the constraints that you make. I think yeah. it's the same with time too, because when you when you know that you have these time constraints set up, um, you really do become more creative with how you're spending your time and you also become i think really focused also um so i'm the type of composer that i have to start at a certain time and end at a certain time i don't work nights i don't work don't wake up in the middle of the night and write cues i don't unless i have a <laughs> unless i have a crazy deadline i yeah. don't you know destroy myself for a whole weekend um uh uh, trying to deliver. But yeah, in that case, when you have multiple stuff going on at once, I think for me, the best thing is to uh, divide the week up and the squeaky wheel kind of gets the grease to a certain extent or the nearest deadline gets the most attention um, yeah, that makes sort sense. of thing. Yeah, I think for us, it's like the deadline is the thing, right? Like it's writer you know that you have a drop dead date and no matter what you're never going to miss that yeah and your schedule has to sort of modify itself on a weekly basis depending yeah. on what deadline is the most uh the most uh, intense but i typically ideally like to work one or two days at a time per project per week okay that's pretty solid and I think it's I think it's good to say because like uh, I fully agree with you, and I'm a firm believer in not glorifying overtime or crazy hours because like we shouldn't aspire to that. Like if you want to do that, that's fine, right? Okay, but don't like. I don't like it when people kind of glorify it in a way where they're like, oh yeah, I did like 14 hour days and I did some overnights, and you know, try and make people feel bad for not doing that if you know what i mean <laughs> i think there's so, there's some sadomasochism in the comp composing community where yeah. there is some badge of honor um you know happening there where where people are are pretty uh, at least vocally obsessed with with work i tend when someone when someone tends to tell me that they're you know working 100 hours a week I tend to um, not believe them. <laughs> For me, like if I work more than, you know, 16 hours in a day, I am useless. I cannot, 
I, you wouldn't want to have me write anything oh, because God. everything I write would yeah. be awful. Right. I'd be the same. Like even 10 hours, I'm already like, no. <laughs> and I think when, and this is, this is probably where I step into like personal preference, but if I'm not feeling well or well rested or healthy to a certain extent, um, I can't really write um, clear, clear headedly. Yeah. I can't um, force the creative, creative juices don't flow as, um, as well. Well, yeah, especially with creativity. Yeah. I kind of disagree with like the tortured artist um, idea of like suffering. Um, I don't know. Maybe there's some cases where that, that makes sense. But for me, it's like, you know, if I'm trying to write something and I'm not feeling well, um, it's not going to work. It's not going to be good. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Like in the beginning, when I was trying to make my way into sound design and voice acting and things, I did put a lot of time in and I put a lot of effort in outside of work and, you know, a lot of extra stuff here and there. So I'm not saying there isn't a need to put in the extra mile. Um, I'm just purely saying like, there's no, glory in like destroying yourself for the art like there's no martyrdom here like <laughs> right i think after after the sort of um honeymoon stage wears off in this industry and like i was the same way i would all hours and crazy hours and and whatnot you realize like oh wait a minute if i do this for the rest of my life i will die like i need <laughs> no, to literally i like, need to like collapse. <laughs> i need to think of this like i'm an athlete right because like we're yeah. going to be doing this for the rest of our life hopefully and if you don't approach it in the same way that an athlete approaches their work uh you're gonna burn out or you're gonna get injured i mean there was a period in time when i was first starting out where i was working so much that I had got nerve damage in my hands oh, and um, yeah, I mean, it's, I've heard stories from friends of mine that are just awful. And uh, uh, ultimately if you're not healthy, you can't do work regardless. So I think that what, after a while you realize like, okay, we're, we're in this for the long run. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Yeah. And like, you don't want, so even if, say, you're going for a goal, right, where you're like, oh, I got a critically acclaimed soundtrack and everyone loves it and I won awards and everything, you want to be able to enjoy that properly. You don't want PTSD from the hours that you put into it. When... <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to get off my soapbox for a second now and uh, <laughs> get back to the topic at hand because I want to talk tech as well. And I'm really curious what kind of rig you're working with and what you usually kind of go to like i mean i'm going to ask you the the age-old question you know what door are you working with what kind of system you got yeah so right now i am a uh, cubase 10 i was a, a logic user for god forever before i switched to cubase mm. <laughs> i switched to cubase uh mid project uh during battle oh wow and, that was brave <laughs> and yeah and that was coincidentally when uh i was not getting a lot of sleep and working crazy hours <laughs> um uh, delirious 3 a.m decision i know i'm gonna switch to cubase that'll work that'll fix everything <laughs> let's update my os too while i'm at it just, yeah um, that won't break anything yeah <laughs> yeah so i'm i'm cubase 10 and i uh do work on a mac and i have a uh sampler pc also and then um i actually just upgraded my um or got a new uh interface i was on an uh, um, apogee ensemble before and i just got the uh, apollo um, 16 which is oh, right. nice pretty nice and then um yeah i've got got a few not a lot i've got a little bit of outboard gear and then uh, modular synth setup and a few uh, external synths also nice and uh, let me just clarify something there you said you have a sampler pc um, so I run my my main projects on kind of like a super uh, Mac Pro, and I actually host a lot of my samples on that Mac Pro. Um, it, it's got a, a crazy amount of RAM. I've got like 380 
gigabytes of RAM on that, which is overkill for the time being. Wow. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's something you could only dream of a few years ago. <laughs> I know, right? Gosh. Um, but then, yeah, I've got a, um, a PC that is the only purpose of this PC is to um, run Vienna Ensemble Pro, which is a, a sampling. Um, it's a VST set, right? Yeah, exactly. And so it basically houses a, 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 my orchestral template um, on the PC only, and then audio over Ethernet sends that into the Mac Pro. Nice. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really think of having a separate PC for samples, but I guess that kind of makes sense because you need something else to kind of handle that while you're handling the sessions. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, especially for something so the orchestral template, you, you're updating it often, like you know you know, probably several times throughout the year, but it doesn't change that much from project to project. Yeah. You know, all the, the sort of um, outfit that you're working with when you're doing orchestral traditional stuff. So yeah. And like the processing for all that orchestral stuff is super intensive. And um, yeah, I just have one, I know of lots of composers have four or five, sampler pcs that are just dead you know one pc is for woodwinds one's for strings one's for um brass and one's for percussion uh, i don't really need that that much um but uh yeah the only thing that this computer does is just uh process uh samples and send me the audio over ethernet um and then in each project i can sort of modify my own template um, that's not the just traditional orchestral stuff uh, directly on on the the Mac Pro. Yeah, I'm going to go back to kind of a question we went to earlier because these days as well, that's another question for fresh composers, shall we say, is like what to prioritize in terms of. I don't have loads of money. I, I'm trying to get gigs so I can get money to buy more stuff. But what should I start with apart from like the basics, which is like, you know, obviously a computer and some speakers, uh, <laughs> you know, and an audio interface. Like what what would you recommend in terms of that? Because you go out there and there's a million sample libraries and some of them are crazy priced and you think, oh, man, if I spend like a, a thousand bucks on this, will I then have enough to then just get jobs? Like how do I how do I pick what to buy first? Right. I mean, in, to a certain extent, I still struggle with that. Like I, I am the type of composer and I think it's because of my background in electronic and hip hop production. I just like love gear. I love having gear, trying gear, even though I don't need, <laughs> I don't need most of it. I mean, one of my good friends, Will Roger is probably, in my opinion, one of the best composers for film tv games whatever he's a genius he is awesome yeah <laughs> his setup compared to mine is ridiculous I, you know he he is kind of the quintessential um composer's composer he's doing uh, amazing work with a relatively makeshift setup so I, I think the main thing for me that I would tell myself at least is like gear doesn't, doesn't matter, right? Like the gear is not going to, it's not going to change your traje trajectory as much as your being prolific is like, as long as you're writing music, even if it's with built in samples from contact, from the free contact library, or from logic or whatever it is writing and like cutting your teeth on techniques that are more difficult to learn than not than like, you know, uh, programming samples. You can learn to program samples relatively quickly and easily given time and resources to buy sample libraries, but you can't learn how to write good, melodies and and uh progressions and you know harmonies and stuff that takes years of of just doing the work i think yeah you can't help that it takes time yeah but it's just it's a difficult question because i think for me too i got extremely 
lucky starting out and one of the first um first libraries that i bought it, it was while i was in school and i was like seeing my bank account dwindle every quarter as yeah like tuition i ended up having to drop out of digipen um after two um I just in the middle of my second year because of oh damn uh, it was just too expensive yeah that's that's tough decision to make oh yeah I mean I didn't have a choice but <laughs> <laughs> I, there's no money to pay yeah, I guess yeah when you get to that point you're like well you know I guess I'm out it's been a fun run <laughs> exactly but I did I like splurged on buying what was it vienna vsl dimension strings was the first big library that i i bought i still use it uh, a little bit till this day it's really really pretty it's super super dry um uh recorded strings you can isolate each player in the ensemble really really dry so you can do a lot of things with it it takes some work to get it to sound um sound right but um that's a case where like i you know maxed out a credit card being very irresp irresponsible <laughs> to buy a sample library but it did end up getting me the opportunity to demo for that hairbrain schemes project yeah and do i think it elevated that demo you know i kind of do like i i don't think that that demo would have sounded as good if i had used um used a stock string library so yeah. basically what i'm saying is kids uh max out your credit cards uh, <laughs> be irresponsible empty your savings accounts <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> spend all the money you want it'll right. be fine <laughs> um yeah i don't know it's a tough question because like a lot that question like has a lot of baggage to it because it of depends course. on so much especially context, in america right? it's so much yeah. context so much context so much it, it, you know pr there's so much privilege involved there's so much um I don't know, but these sample libraries are exorbitantly expensive, lots of them. And I think they should be ex expensive because they're they're marvels of technology and they enable composers to make, you know, collectively hundreds of millions of dollars a year easily. Yeah, and especially the ones that take so long to record each individual articulation and everything. It's it's insane amount of work. Right. Uh, I think some sample library companies do a really good job of student discounts and usage stuff where, where you send mm -hmm. an email and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, sure. You can, we'll give you this for usage, but if you start getting work, you know, you, you should buy the whole library sort of thing. Um, Spitfire does, does some good stuff with um, student discounts. A lot of places do. Um, but yeah, I think I think when you are first starting out, focusing on writing rather than convincing mockups is probably a good idea. So if you're you're if you're at the point where your mockups need to be, and a mockup is is uh, for people that know don't know is uh, is making your digital piece of music sound like it's real, basically. Yeah. If you're going for realism at that point, you're probably at the point where you're you're getting enough work to be able to start getting into some of the entry level libraries and and whatnot. Yeah, and you can do a, you can do a lot with simple libraries. I mean, if you're if you go in and you can you can do uh, editing and mixing and use your busing and reverbs well, you can make a stock library sound fantastic. Um, I hear a lot of demos that um, are written with bad libraries that I think sound great because mostly the writing is good. Yeah. So I, I think that's that should be the focus. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think back to earlier because um, I have to admit like the first person that got me into game sound design and music um, is Nobuo Uematsu from Final Fantasy VII in my case. And back in the, and then I replayed like one to six um, and even those that are made with like the simplest technology available at the time, the writing comes through so strong. It's it's still like the melodies and the harmonies and the you know all the chord progressions he uses that they're, they're amazing. Like the way he ties it all together, it's still incredible. And that's on like a beepy boop, snes or nes, you know. <laughs> and I think that that's the thing is like I I. 
I'm guilty of this too. Like you have good samples, you've got good, you know, mixing chops. You can fake it until you make it to a certain extent, but you can't fake good writing. No, you, you do writing with, you know, stock MIDI and it'll sound good. And, yeah. and I think any composer or audio director that hears demos that are done creatively, uh, um, not going for realism, kind of take like taking the not going for realism as a badge and being like, I'm going to show you, you know, I'm going to write, write a jazz quintet for the stock, you know, from the stock MIDI uh, sounds and people that know will understand the quality behind that. It doesn't have to sound real to be good quality. Yeah, exactly. Um, but going back to disintegration, I do want to ask a, a couple more questions on it and um, just kind of ask, you know, what was what was your most challenging moment on the project? Um, I think for a project like disintegration, the most challenging thing for me um, as a so the way I like to and this is just because this is all I know from my experience, I think, um, and my training and how I how I expected I would enter the industry. So I always entered the industry with like a, like a technical understanding, uh, thinking that I, I would probably not be able to write music for games. I would most likely be doing at best technical or not technical, um, uh, implementation for music. Mm. So I, I always approach the scores that I write, um, actually, heading up uh the the implementation side as well i'm always entering starting projects usually uh, if if they're uh wanting me to do this um uh also implementing the music myself too and i think for me it just makes writing music a little bit easier if i understand the the tech behind it yeah of course right and and I, so the way I like to get the way, this is the way I get involved with harebrained schemes games, for example, is um, I'm sort of in at the ground level and deciding what the pillars of the game are and what game uh, mechanics are going to be interacting with each other throughout the project. And then I'm building a music system um, that is built on top of those sort of pillars of the game design. Um, and so with disintegration, we did the same thing, but we also were really cautious, I think, about what we were um, going to be doing with the music. And I think that was just the, na the nature of the size of the game. I think people um, look at disintegration and they think that this is a relatively large studio. Uh, but the reality is it's really only about 30 people. Yeah, I was looking at that. It's kind of tiny in a way for what, what you made. <laughs> it's definitely punching above its weight class. Um, and I think there was there was always this idea at the beginning of like, okay, we we just want to focus on what we know we can control with the music. And then um, when we can get to it, we're going to be able to expand that musical interactivity vocabulary down the road. Um, so that was that was difficult for me. I mean, um, there's not a lot that you can do from an engineering standpoint once you've been working on a project for a certain amount of time and you've got a system set up and you really don't have the bandwidth to um, sort of reach those lofty goals that you wanted for interactivity with the score. Um, so that was, I think, the biggest struggle for me in the the um, cinematics also, I think, in video games are also um, difficult because they tend to come late in the project. And, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of, of uh, minutes to score and, and not a lot of time to do it. So you just kind yeah. of always, you know, you want a little bit more time, right? Always. <laughs> It's my number one nemesis is time. Right. And what about the flip side then? What was your uh, what was your proudest moment? Um, I think my proudest moment for for disintegration was making Marcus cry. 
<laughs> oh wow <laughs> now that is that is a proud moment for any composer i think yeah we're we're monsters we live off the tears <laughs> of our game directors but yeah i was um i had worked on the um the main theme for a little bit and got it to a place where i was comfortable sharing it with marcus and sent it over to him and brought him to tears which was which was a highlight i was pretty stoked that um that he was that excited about it and yeah i mean let's clarify um, your tears of like excitement and joy. happiness about it you know rather <laughs> than like oh my god what did, did you do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's you know that's that's uh that was a cool experience especially you know given my history with with halo playing that as a kid and and uh yeah it's just one of those bizarre situations where it's kind of uh doesn't feel real you know yeah that moment will be like surreal forever It'll be like okay so the, the guy who co-created one of my childhood games i wrote music and for his game and, and he cried he liked it so much okay that's that's a thing that happened in my life cool all right <laughs> So before my final question, I have possibly one of the hardest questions I ever ask, uh, which is basically, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, it's a really good question. I think it would be chill out. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it's going to be okay. Um, I, I, you know, I think expanding on that, is that um, you're pursuing something that is to the outside world, it seems like a stretch. It's not sort of the normal sort of job, but it really is something that is also just a job, right? Like it, you can be very passionate yeah. about it. You can live and breathe it, which I do, and get up and feel so grateful and so happy and so uh like you know overjoyed that i get to do this every day yeah but don't get distracted by uh, you know the allure of what is essentially just a job i think that goes back to what we were talking about before about the ability to have something like this become an sort of over overruling thing in your life that that makes you work insane hours and destroys relationships and uh you know forces you to be sort of self-obsessed and and um overly concerned with your own progress and whatnot um yeah there's a way to have a life and have a career at the same time you don't have to choose between <laughs> yeah and I, I think it's very good advice for anyone listening as well because i think what people need to realize as well is that okay you love your job and you know i love my work i mean i wouldn't do it if i didn't love it and uh, i put the extra time in for sure but these crazy hours or this crazy commitment and the self-obsession that some people get and they're like it's okay it's for work it's for the art it's for work you know um, and I think what we need to realize is that if someone in our lives was doing that with anything else, we'd be seriously concerned, <laughs> you know, like if they were, still, if they were that obsessed with, um, you know, I mean, you can go to alcohol and drugs, but even any other things, if they were in, obsessed to that level, you would be concerned. <laughs> but for work, it's kind of allowed and we make it kind of okay that people they're like, oh, oh, it's for work. Oh, okay, don't worry about it then. That's fine. It's important. Work is important. And that's what's kind of driven into us from a young age. It's like, you know, you know as long as you're working and you're earning money, then it's fine. Whatever, you do what you need to do. And, uh, you know, I think it's good to bear in mind that like, yeah, 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 there is work. But, you know, as long as you're paying your bills and, you know, you're not kind of desperate, then, you know, calm, calm down a little bit, okay? Because, you know, life's also there and you should experience that. <laughs> exactly. That's the advice. Calm down. Yeah, chill out, man. That's that's the advice for for young John Everest back in the day. Like, chill, chill out, man. Like, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> okay, so for my final question, um, I'm going to have to ask another question that can be very long or very short. Usually, very short. <laughs> 
Um, what other projects are you working on that are coming soon that you can actually tell us about? Well, I've got one I can I can talk about. Um, I I just uh, was able to score a lovely short film by director Jen Ravenna Tran uh, called And Then. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, short film that takes place in Tokyo, and that is. Gosh, it's probably. I think it's going to be released in in five or six weeks. Um, oh, cool! But for more, yeah, for more information on that, um, you can uh, hit up uh, Jen or myself on Twitter. Uh, Jen, I think she's at Jen Ravenna, and she's she's a, a con. She was a, traditionally a concept artist um, at like uh, Arena Net and Magic uh, the Gathering, but she's oh, cool making a move into cinematography and directing and and she's very very talented so so was was really happy to to be able to score that and it's another example of of switching things up i was in the midst of finishing disintegration and at the end of that project a lot of it was um you know heavy bombastic sort of sci-fi stuff and then i transitioned into very very uh uh, low key understated solo violins and a little bit of woodwinds and love story music sort of thing. Ah, oh, cool. So it's nice to kind of switch gears now and again, isn't it? Oh yeah. I love it. I, I think, I think that's, that's a very in, uh, invigorating part of this job is, is um, wiping the slate clean at the end of a project and sort of moving on to, to another uh, embodying another um, musical identity. Definitely. Awesome. Well, I have to say, I'm sorry to see you go, John. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, but I hope you'll join us again soon in the near future. Oh, I would love to. I would love to. Hope, hopefully many more to come. Yes, definitely. And thanks very much for your time, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Hey everyone, this is Sam. Thanks very much for listening to the Sound Architect podcast today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If so, there are many ways you can support the show, which is incredibly appreciated. Obviously, there's the financial way where you can support us on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash sounddesignuk. However, there are many other ways which also help, such as liking, subscribing, reviewing, commenting and sharing via whatever channel you listen on. Even a like or share on social media really, really helps. So thanks so much for your support already. It really is a work of passion for me and I'd love to keep sharing the knowledge from all these talented and wonderful people. Thanks again and catch you on the next episode.